and get started. Um, so thank you all for attending. I'm Priyanka from Poplar um, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to Jameson and Austin from Fritz um, and they're going to talk you through um, artificial intelligence for augmented reality creators. So over to you. Thanks so much Priyanka. And thank you to Poplar for having us here. Um, so I'm Jameson and I am the CTO of Fritz AI. Uh, just a little bit about me, about my background. Um, I'm sort of a reformed physicist. Uh, I went to the University of Michigan uh, and then uh, did my PhD in machine learning at MIT. Um, and so that's really where my background lies in the data science and machine learning side of things. Um, and now, as I mentioned, co-founder and CTO of Fritz AI, we are a Boston-based company that uh, enables developers, AR creators to build AI models and put them into mobile apps. So a little bit of an agenda for today. Uh, I'm gonna start by defining AI, uh, specifically in the context of uh, you know, AR and how it would be relevant to creators there. Uh, I'll then spend a little bit of time differentiating AI and AR. I think there's a lot of overlap there and it can sometimes be confusing. And then I'll talk about opportunities, challenges, and the actual tools that you can use to combine AI and AR. And we'll wrap up with some additional resources and a little bit of, of a tour of the Fritz AI platform that in my opinion is sort of the easiest way to get started here. So what is AI? Uh, artificial intelligence to me includes all of the algorithms and statistical models that are capable of performing tasks without explicit instructions. So what does that mean in a practical example? Uh, a traditional algorithm that I would say is not artificial intelligence uh, would be like a green screen uh, where you know, there is a green background behind an actor and then you know, you're writing uh, a little bit of code to say, find me some green pixels and remove them. Uh, that's a very explicit instruction that you would tell uh, to a computer. But how do you do that with generic backgrounds? For example, I'm using a virtual background so you can't see my messy uh, home office behind me. Uh, and that is a much harder task. And what we've done is actually trained an AI model or Zoom has trained an AI model uh, to just generically remove backgrounds and separate them uh, from the speaker without explicit instructions for how to deal with every single background, right? Uh, and so the way that most of the machine learning models like this work uh, is by example. So you show them a whole bunch of training data. The models then learn patterns and correlations in that data to help them achieve their tasks, right? Uh, so these models then form the engines behind a whole bunch of features that I'm sure you all use every day. So predictive keyboards, uh, photo organizers, recommender systems, object trackers, uh, background removers, like the one that I'm using now. So if you want to do AI, you really have to uh, take into account the entire life cycle. Uh, so this starts by selecting a model that can perform your task, collecting data uh, and labeling that data, training the model itself, then deploying it to the device that you want it to be run on, and then seeing how it works and finding cases where it maybe doesn't work quite as well as you'd want collecting more data and repeating the whole cycle over again. Uh, so this is not something that you can just do once, get a model and then forget about it. It's really a continuous iterative process and you have to you know, be willing to go through this loop a few times before you're really gonna get something that works. We tried to make that as easy as possible with Fritz AI and I'll show you some examples of that towards the end of the webinar. So as you are doing this, this uh, life cycle, I really sort of think about breaking it up into two parts. Uh, there are two modes of AI. So the first is model training. And this is where you're gathering a bunch of data, whether it's images or text or other sensors. Uh, you're also labeling that data. So you know these are all of my photos of dogs. These are all of my photos of cats. And then you are training this model to correctly predict uh, whatever you want about that data. After you've trained the model and it's as accurate as, as you think you can get it, uh, you then switch over to the second mode of AI, which is inference. So these models are now deployed, they're put on these devices and they are just making predictions or inferences constantly. So they're not learning anymore in this case, they're just doing the task that you've trained it to do. And oftentimes, you know, you're gonna perform some inferences, you're gonna realize it doesn't work quite uh, as well as you'd like in certain cases, and you're gonna have to switch back to training, create a new version and then deploy that for more inference. So 
this type of process, this uh, life cycle can be applied to a whole different uh, varieties of data. The first would be computer vision, You're probably familiar with uh, you know, all of these applications that are using the camera. So uh, live video, uh, still images, you can, in this case, we're doing style transfer on, on an image. Uh, it's also applicable to text data via natural language processing and even speech and audio. So identifying which song is playing or transcribing things in real time. So now I want to switch gears and start differentiating a little bit between AI and AR, because this is an area where uh, I think it gets a little bit confusing. And one of the main reasons that it's confusing is that both AI and AR use the word model a lot, and I think they mean pretty different things. Uh, so when I think about augmented reality, uh, I think about you know, building a 3D model of a scene. So you know, where is everything in a room? Um, and then you'll also have models of various uh, virtual objects. So maybe it's a character that you want to place or a mask that you want to put on on a person's face. You know, all of those are sort of the building blocks of these AR scenes. The models that we use in AI are a little bit different. There are these task-based predictive models that we've trained using some of the techniques that I talked about previously. And the way that AI uh, can really be integrated with AR is by using these tasks to help you build this 3D scene. So these AI models are now starting to replace some of these more traditional computer vision approaches uh, that go into building these AR experiences. So if you want to detect, say, vertical or horizontal surfaces, in a scene so that you can place objects on them, uh, you would use an AI model for that. If you want to detect depth in a scene so that you can you know, properly segment uh, and include various uh, virtual objects, you can use an AI model for that. All of these uh, AI models are in support of the sort of broader task of modeling a scene in 3D for your AR experiences. This is really, really, uh, incredible when you get it to work right. So there are millions and millions of people today that use AR combined with AI. Uh, I'm sure everybody has, has tried out Snapchat. You can detect a user's face with an AI model, build up that 3D uh, model of the user's face, and then uh, attach various lenses, face masks uh, to it. Companies like Wayfair are using this type of uh, 3D scene building to enable new shopping experiences. So you can take a couch or a chair that you might uh, want to put in your room and you can try it out virtually. And all of that is powered by these AI models that are capable of constructing this 3D scene. These are just a few of the areas that I'm most excited about when it comes to combining AI and AR. Talked a little bit about Snap and social AR, but there's also gaming. I mean, Pokemon Go uh, was incredibly popular game. Uh, you can get these really deep immersive UX experiences where you can literally copy objects in the real world and place them into you know, presentations or, or other content. Uh, it's incredible for brand engagement and then uh, shopping and commerce. So virtual try on, uh, you know, the furniture use case that I showed in the previous slide. This is a little bit of an intro into some of the platforms that you'd be using to actually combine AI and AR. Uh, so if you're programming for native mobile experiences, you're going to be using AR Kit on Apple uh, iOS devices. You're going to be using AR Core for Google Android devices. Uh, we've now got Snap Lens Studio. And then there is a number of web-based cross-platform uh, JavaScript solutions like 8th Wall and Roar. And underneath each of these uh, systems, there are special <clears throat> AI platforms as well. So AR Kit uh, uses CoreML, which is Apple's system. Uh, AR Core is going to be using TensorFlow Lite. And something like Lens Studio is now capable of uh, integrating with SnapML, which is Snap's on-device machine learning framework. So here are just three of, I think, the, the biggest challenges that I see people facing when they start trying to combine AI and AR. So the first is really making sure that you're defining your AI task. So you need to know exactly what you want your model to do before you start. Uh, so an example of uh, a task that I don't think is well-defined is saying, um, I want my AR lens to detect chairs. You need to really be more specific about what type of detection you want to perform. Do you simply want to uh, predict whether or not there's a chair in the photo at all? Do you want to draw a bounding box around that chair? 
Do you want to uh, segment that chair out so that you can do occlusion? Do you want to identify uh, 3D key points on that chair so that you, know, you can maybe manipulate it in 3D space? It's really important that you get down to that level of specifics whenever you are starting an AI project, because that's going to inform the type of model that you're going to need, the type of data that you're going to have to collect, uh, and how you're actually going to integrate it into the rest of your app. So if you do one thing, uh, spend a lot of time really thinking about what is the task that I have to perform. The second thing uh, is to plan for this complete life cycle. So you're going to have to collect and label your data. You're going to have to train your model. You're going to have to evaluate it. And most importantly, you're going to have to repeat this. It is extremely rare uh, that you will collect enough data, train a model that that's good enough, uh, your first try through. Uh, there are always edge cases that you're going to have to consider. Uh, it's, it's always going to be the case that you are noticing areas for improvement. And you're just going to have to commit to going through this cycle a few times. It's a continuous process. And then the last thing that you know, I see as a, as a common roadblock is people forgetting the glue. So these AI models are uh, complicated statistical models. And they don't always produce outputs that are easy for an AR creator to, to use. So you know, a lot of the times they're outputting matrices of numbers and probabilities that are, you know, quite frankly, hard for uh, uh, us to interpret. And so you're going to have to make an effort to look at which post-processing you're going to have to apply to take your model's raw output and actually turn it into something useful for an AR scene. Um, so for example, you know, a pose estimation model might detect key points on your face, eyes, nose, mouth. The actual model itself is going to output something that looks kind of like a heat map. And it, it, the heat map is going to tell you where it thinks an eye might be. But your uh, AR scene really just needs a single point, an XY coordinate on the image. And so there's going to be a little bit of code, a little bit of post processing that has to go into transforming that heat map into an actual usable key point. And then <clears throat> lastly, I just wanted to focus on a few limitations. Um, you know, while we've made a ton of advances with AI in the last five to 10 years, uh, there are still things that are really hard uh, to do, even though they're super interesting and super important for AR creators. Uh, so the first is full occlusion. Um, so this is a really big problem. Obviously, the more that you can do to occlude these objects, the more immersive your experiences feel. But this is a really hard problem that I don't think we've, we've fully solved yet. It's getting a lot better now that we have uh, different sensors on, on devices. But this is still, you know, you can't expect things to be perfect. Uh, depth estimation related to occlusion, uh, you know, this is something that, again, you know, it really takes some advances in hardware, like multiple cameras, the new LiDAR sensors, um, to get sort of the high resolution quality that we need to do real time depth estimation. And then the last is 3D pose estimation. So it's pretty impressive how much you can predict about the 3D world from 2D images, but we're just not quite at the point where you can reliably do 3D pose estimation of objects with just a single uh, 2D camera. Here's some additional resources if you'd like to dive more into any of these topics. Uh, these were you know, put together by the, the Fritz team, uh, along with some input from a lot of really smart people. So we've got a comprehensive guide for working with AI and AR specifically in Lens Studio. Uh, and then we've got another you know, great overview, just all of the techniques that you're going to need to, to think about when you're combining AI and AR. And so for the last few sections of this uh, webinar, I want to talk a bit about actually doing the combining AI and AR with Fritz AI and our studio platform. Uh, so Fritz AI is a no code platform that help you train machine learning models for AR. And we provide cross platform functionality, iOS, Android native code, as well as support for SnapML and Lens Studio. I'm really excited to talk about Fritz AI for SnapML. Uh, this is you know, something that we just released in beta. Uh, we're really excited about all of the possibilities here because there's just so many great use cases uh, for combining these AI models with lenses and other effects with inside uh, Snap. And so with our platform, you're going to be able to generate the data that you need to train these models, build these custom models all without code. Uh, we can give you pre-trained ML templates to get you started really quickly. And all of the models that you train uh, with Fritz AI 
will be compatible and just ready to implement directly in Lens Studio. Pre-trained templates are probably the easiest way to get started with AI and AR. So these are ready to use SnapML templates. Uh, we've already done the work to hook up the models uh, to the actual AR effects. Uh, we've trained the models ourselves. You don't have to write any ML code. You don't have to deal with uh, Python notebooks or any statistics. Uh, and it's just really easy to download these projects, see them running and start playing around with them. If you do want to uh, end up training your own custom model, which is often the case, uh, we've got a complete suite of tools to help you get started quickly. Uh, so the data labeling and annotation task is one of the uh, most time consuming and my least favorite part of all of this. You know, going through and collecting thousands and thousands of images and drawing segmentation mass or bounding boxes on them is, is a real chore. And I think it stops a lot of people from getting started with AI. So we've built a, a synthetic data generation tool into our platform. And the way that this works is uh, you will find a handful of images uh, that contain the object that you would like to uh, train an AI model for. So in this case, we're doing face masks. Uh, you're going to remove the background of those images and then label them like you see uh, happening here. So we're just clicking on the screen and drawing a segmentation of mask around there. And then from those images, we will generate thousands more uh, that are suitable for training your AI model with. So this is a great way to get started quickly. You know, in really just a few minutes, you can uh, go ahead and label a couple dozen images and get a data set that is suitable for training a model. Um, this annotation flow works for uh, data set generator and any other data that you might have. And it's all based in the browser. So it's just really easy to get started and sort of fly through some of these annotation tasks. We also build into uh, all of our systems really great data augmentation. Uh, and so that's going to increase the amount of diversity in your data sets, which is going to make sure that they work uh, in more scenarios and for more people. Once you've collected and labeled and generated all of this data, next phase is training. Uh, with Fritz AI, you can train models without code. Uh, so you fill out this form, select the type of model that you'd like to, like to train based on your data, uh, and then click a button and we will uh, handle all of the rest for you. So uh, the best part about this is that all of the models are automatically for, uh, formatted so that they can be dropped directly into Lens Studio and we'll even generate templates for you. So once you've downloaded this model file uh, or the Lens Studio template project, all you have to do is open it up. There's a few buttons you're going to have to click in Lens Studio, but we've pre-configured as many of the components as possible uh, so that you don't have to deal too much with the complicated ML side of things. So what are some of the things that you can do with Fritz AI Studio? Uh, so the first is custom segmentation. Uh, so in, <clears throat> with segmentation models, you're gonna be isolating unique objects and masking them out in the scene. So here we've trained that mask model and now you can change the color of your mask in real time for your lens. Object detection is all about recognizing and locating instances of objects or brands or products in an image. So <clears throat> in this case, someone has trained an object detector to detect healthy versus unhealthy foods. So uh, the broccoli is getting a box around it uh, with a thumbs up and the donuts are getting a box around them with the thumbs down. Image labeling is about producing a single label for an image. Uh, so you can recognize, you know, what is the, the most important object in the photo? In this case, one of our uh, contributors made a lens that would detect his bulldog in the photos. And then lastly, we've got style transfer. So uh, this is all about training a model to take images as an input and then apply the style of another artist or another work of art to them. And this is a really cool way to create custom filters. So that's it for uh, Fritz AI for SnapML. We're really excited about this. You can sign up for free uh, if you go to Fritz AI, um, our website. And then we've also got a really great blog with a whole bunch of resources on uh, SnapML, on training your own custom models, on integrating them into mobile apps over at Heartbeat. The last thing I want to make sure to mention is uh, if anybody here is planning on attending SNAP's Lens Fest, uh, we will be there, we'll be presenting. Um, I believe uh, the dates for that are December 8th through the 10th. So, you know, feel free to, to look us up and I hope to see you there. That is it. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much uh, for presenting that. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and just ask away. Um, I know I have one, uh, so I'll get started. Um, so in your opinion, what do you think is the next break breakthrough for AI and AR to help make AI more commonplace in the world? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for me, I think I'm most excited about the new sensors and the new uh, chips that are going into all of these different devices. So, you know, phones have had cameras on them forever. Um, and it's really only been in the last couple of years that the, the processors in the phones have gotten fast enough to do this type of AI in real time, because uh, that's really what you need for immersive AR experiences. And now, you know, you're seeing these devices get additional sensors like LiDAR, for example, which can provide super high resolution depth mapping uh, that you need to do sort of that last mile of occlusion and sort of scene rendering. And so I'm really excited to see what people do uh, with the new um, uh, LiDAR sensors in the iPhone 12 and you know the, the additional camera rigs that are coming on all of these different mobile devices. Yeah, definitely. Um, I see that Jordi has asked um, whether you have a Unity SDK. Um, so we do not have a Unity SDK at this time. Um, it's, it's definitely something that uh, uh, we've looked at in the past, but for now we don't have one. I've got a couple of questions if I may. Um, one was uh, with the example of where you were, um, the contributor you said has kind of trained the model to detect a bulldog. And you had a kind of score, a probability score of that being the case. How do you recommend that working? Because presumably there is, you know, a scenario where it's like high probability and then from a different angle and an image has not been trained, it suddenly is, you know, low probability again. And it'll, I assume, kind of uh, kind of bounce between yes, positive recognition versus not sure. Um, so is it kind of like when you go above a certain threshold, that is enough to say I'm positive this is a bulldog? Um, and you should just take that signal of it going past that, that gate once as being the time that it's detected, or is it more that you need to monitor it constantly and you give, say, a certain number of seconds, and if it's above a threshold for, say, two seconds, and I'm still positive during that time, it is um, the recognized object. Yeah, that's a great question. So it de really depends on your use case, and this is kind of uh, what I meant when I was talking about my third bullet point for the challenges here. Um, so all of the type of logic that you're talking about is the glue, right, that takes the raw output from these models and turns it into something useful for your experience. Um, so, you know, the model is just going to keep spitting out this uh, probability score for every single frame that you feed it in. And so it's going to be up to you to think about, you know, how do I want the rest of my application to behave? So, uh, you know, if you're just trying to trigger an effect, say, you know, maybe all you care about is that it reaches some, some threshold of confidence once the effect is triggered, and then, you know, it's, it doesn't need to be triggered again. Uh, if you are trying to maybe affix something to the dog, you know, as you're moving it around and you want it to appear when the dog is in the frame, but then disappear when it's not in the frame, you know, maybe it's, it's uh, something you're monitoring constantly, right? And so if the probability dips, the effect will go away. All of that really just depends on the user experience that you're going for. Uh, but it's important that you think about those things ahead of time because, you know, there's gonna be some variability, there's gonna be some noise and you have to plan for those scenarios. Oh, I want to give opportunities to others to ask questions if anyone has any. Um, if not, I will ask my second question, which was just around the, in your in your opinion, the the kind of maturity around the ability to run web, um, like AI in web browsers. Uh, and I understand from what you were saying, there's kind of differences in the identification versus like bounding box and kind of segmentation um, workload that's put onto a device. Um, but when it comes to running these models through a browser, like how, what are the obstacles at the moment to having a performant and kind of reliable, um, whether it's classification or identification kind of system uh, at the moment? We've come a long way. It's, it's actually possible to do quite a bit in the browser. Um, so frameworks like TensorFlow.js, um, Onyx, ONNX, uh, which is a partnership between Microsoft and Facebook, um, and a few other players, uh, they have 
runtimes, uh, JavaScript libraries that you can use to run these models. And they will actually make use of GPUs that exist um, you know, on, on computers through like things like WebAssembly and, and WebGL. So uh, you can actually access a lot of hardware through the browser these days. And so I'm, I'm very bullish on those things. I, I think it's definitely possible to build unique, interesting AI powered experiences uh, that run directly in the browser. Um, of course, you know, you're not going to be able to use models that require a lot of computing power. I mean, I think my my new iPhone 12 is actually probably uh, more powerful than my than my MacBook Pro, <laughs> um, especially when it comes to special neural processors. So you will have to consider um, model architectures that are small enough and efficient enough to to work in a browser. But you can do quite a bit. Um, and you know, one thing I'll say is that you know what we try to do at Fritz AI is, is make sure that all of our models are designed to run on, on these devices that might not have you know, the, the large graphics cards that you would find in you know, a gaming PC, for example. So um, there's a lot of people that are, are working on making models more efficient, smaller, and uh, I think they work just fine in the browser. Cool, any other questions from anyone else? If not, I'll ask my third question. <laughs> uh, I have one more question, which is uh, a bit more general, but um, I think AR can sometimes be accused of being a bit um, superficial uh, at this point in time. Um, and everyone you know, will, will identify happily face filters as being kind of augmented reality that, that they know at least. Um, I was wondering if you had any examples of kind of either real world examples of, um, of really meaningful applications of AR that you've worked on or just kind of use cases um, that you can um, point to because I guess you know in, in a very kind of deep meaningful context using computer vision for things like being able to detect kind of um, you know, ailments and cancerous growth for example is like a really deep and meaningful example and, and I you know I, I expect that fully to be part of the um, the future um, path of, of computer vision um, as these things become more kind of um, commoditized. Um, but yeah, just want curious if you had any examples from Fritz's work of um, of really exciting applications that go beyond the kind of ephemeral and um, superficial kind of face filter type um, uh, marketing experiences. Yeah, uh, so we've got a few of these actually. And if you go to our website um, www.fritz.ai, there's a few case studies there. Um, but you know, one in the example that that you chose. Uh, so there's a, a company called MD Acne, um, and this is more AI focused, less AR focused, uh, but they make uh, products to help you with skincare. And you know, traditionally what you do is you make an appointment with a dermatologist. It's really hard to, to get in, especially in, in the US. Uh, so you wait a long time and then you know, they look at you for a minute or two and provide uh, some recommendations for skincare products. And then you need to do this again every few months uh, to see how you're, you're, prog you're progressing. And you know, this is a, a big pain for a lot of people. So what MD Acne did is they, they trained a machine learning model um, to essentially detect blemishes on your skin, uh, use that to come up with the uh, appropriate personalized mix of skincare treatments for you. Uh, they'll send those treatments to your house and then you can use their app you know, every day if you want to essentially do that uh, dermatology visit, the, the skin check, uh, via AI in the app and they will track your progress over time and, and they can adjust the skincare treatment as needed there. And so I think that's a really good example of AI encapsulating like a couple minutes of an expert's time into a model that anyone can then use uh, uh, over and over and over again as much as they want. Um, you know, we've also seen cases of people building experiences to help farmers uh, in, you know, say uh, East Africa identify uh, different diseases or different pests on their crops. And they can do this uh, because it's all running on device. Um, they can do this where there might not be internet connectivity um, or they don't have uh, uh, large data plans to be sending you know, video or images up to, to the cloud. So I think there's a lot of really neat applications of AI and AR um, that go beyond just sort of the, the social AR that, that we're seeing now. And you know, I don't even discount social AR, like we've seen just the massive amounts of uh, uh, engagement that these types of AI features and AR features can attract, um, and you know I, I think it's really 
uh, impressive. And it, 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 there's going to be a lot of interesting advertising and marketing, uh, you know, efforts that that use that in the future. Yeah, I am being slightly facetious with the whole uh, face sort of thing. Um, we obviously, uh, as Poplar, work on these a lot of the time and do see the value in it and uh, bring, bring it to people's um, awareness. So yeah, uh, it's not just as silly as it sounds. Uh, but yeah, thanks for those uh, answers. It's uh, really in interesting to learn about those uh, use cases. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, we had have a few more uh, queries about the Unity SDK. Do you think it's in the future for Fritz? Um, we'll have to go back and, and sort of look at our, our priorities, but you know, we know that uh, a lot of people use Unity. We've used Unity ourselves in the past. It's a really great platform. Um, so you know, we'd love to chat more with people uh, about you know what they're what they're looking to to build and you know maybe we can help out with that so feel free to uh to contact us directly about unity perfect um uh does anyone else have any questions i i, I am aware that there's a few people that um arrived a little bit later so they did um miss the ma the majority of your slides but um, feel free to unmute and ask a question. And and we're going to be making uh, the whole video uh, public, and you know we can we can provide slides as well for people that came in a bit late. Well, if there's no more questions, then I think. Uh, we can wrap up. Thank you so much to um, Jameson for presenting and Austin from Fritz. Um, just to mention again, um, I'm Frank from Poplar. Um, some of you are creators and know us and some of you don't. Um, but yes, please get in touch with Fritz for all your a AI and AR needs. Um, you can contact them on your links I think you had on your last slide. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, you can contact me at Priyanka at poplar.studio. Um, we will be able to send this slide over and any of the links um, in the slides over to you afterwards. And yeah, thank you so much for attending.